This is the Robert Way Forward. Dear guests, welcome to the Robert Capital Markets Day of 2021. And as this is a hybrid event, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome everyone here on site in Helsinki. Thank you very much for coming and joining us today. And of course, those also online joining us today, hopefully you're also a numerous crowd. My name is Daniel Palander, and on most days I'm the head of operational excellence, working on supply chain development and inventory management issues. But today is special, and I get to be your host, uh, taking us firmly but gently through the program that we've prepared for you today. Could you change the slide, please? Thank you. So, uh, you'll get to meet the, the rest of the speakers in a while, so they'll give a short introduction after, uh, in the beginning of each of the presentations. And uh, next slide, please, Tommy. And as you can see, we've prepared a very, very interesting program for you today. We've got a lot of strategy, visions, numbers, and even technical aspects about the Robit world for you today. My main task, of course, today is getting a dialogue going. So hopefully we'll get a lot of questions. And we've organized a bit of time. After each presentation, we have about three minutes where we can get questions. And at the end, we've got 20 minutes for a more deeper discussion and a questions and answers session. Those who are on site, of course, you have a bit of an advantage. So once you put up your hand, we will bring you the mic so that the online audience can also hear, hear you at that point. Those online, please use the chat. So even during the presentations, keep those questions coming into the chat and uh, I'll make sure that they get asked then at the each of, end of each presentation or in the Q&A session. So at this point again, welcome everyone. And uh, it's my great pleasure to ask on stage our group CEO, Mr. Tommi Lehtonen, who will give us a presentation on the strategy for sustainable growth. Tommi, welcome. Thank you, Daniel. First of all, disclaimer, uh, as a standard part for this type of a presentation and, and Again, my name is Tommy Lehtonen. I'm the CEO of Robit. I have been in the mining and construction industry for close to 30 years in, a, in different global roles. And now since 2017 with Robit and as a CEO since 2019. First, again, good morning and, and thank you for taking the time to, 
to learn more about Robit. Robit in brief, 2020, roughly 92 million euros in, in net sales. We have four factories, four modern factories in Finland, South Korea, Australia and UK. In total, we have major office locations in eight countries. We sold 2020 to close to 100 countries directly from our legal entities. So we are, we are a global, global company. We are a team of 272 what we call drilling consumable specialists. In addition to this, because of our partnership model, both with the subcontractors and distribution partners, we have a, a big group of uh, people working full-time for Robit outside of our organization. We focus only on drilling consumables, which is so-called OPEX business, when our customers operate, they consume continuously our products. So demand by nature is, is for our products is, is very stable. Total market potential for our addressable market is around 2 billion euros and, and gives us a, a good room for growth. Robit's market share currently is around 5%. And at the bottom of, bottom of the slide, you see some images of our typical products and, and key applications for us. Let's talk a little bit about company culture. Our brand promise is further faster, and I think it really kind of describes nicely the, the culture we have in Robit, which is a very sales oriented go an extra mile to serve the customer type of a culture that has been built through the years. We further developed the, the culture ahead as a management, of course, using this foundation as a, as a strength and, and with our values, we serve it speed is our first value. Speed is a key in any business. Speed of implementation is is part of successful business, especially in service business. What this means, of course, is empowerment of our people to make decisions to enable them to serve our customers effectively. We drive change. What is constant in today's world? It's, it's change, right? So how do you take change? We should take change as a positive. Change is an opportunity. Change to drive change to improve our performance and so on. So we drive the culture of looking at change always as a positive. We respect everyone, naturally a key, key value for any company. But this means everybody in our community, uh, suppliers, distributors, each other, competitors and so on. So we treat everybody with respect. These values are used kind of to set an expectation to each and every Robit employee. Now we jump into, into our market. And I would say one strength we have, we have very good knowledge where the potential is and who is playing there in the, in the, in the space. So if you look at the, the left-hand side graph, it's showing kind of a split per different suppliers how the 2 billion euro potential is covered. So in this business, we have two fairly large size companies covering close to half of the market potential. And we are number, number four currently on the way to become undistributed number three. Again, there also we saw a little bit more visibility on how the market potential is split between the key customer applications on the right hand side. You know, mining represents about 60% of our addressable potential and construction about 40%. Our addressable market, based on our estimation, is growing 3 to 5% per year. Mining demand by nature is stable even over the cycles. And construction naturally is a local business, uh, even Inside the countries, different areas have different cycles, uh, but we have one common global megatrend, which is the urbanization. So 
we really truly know where our customers are and how much they use our, our products from different suppliers. Just a quick look at how our net sales is split between the different reportable market areas for us. And, and, and again, kind of a highlighting the fact of our global presence and sales share in, in, in different markets. We are well present, for example, in all of the key, key mining markets globally. Strong growth in mining. A couple of years ago, looking at our growth plans, we, we saw that the mining is the key, key segment for us to have sustainable growth. We have grown clearly faster in mining, currently representing about 60% of our business. Especially, I, I want to highlight the fastest growing segment in mining, which is the underground mining. Uh, my colleague, George Apostolo Bolos will, will open the mining segment more in detail in his presentation. We also have some strong niche businesses like uh, the piling and geothermal well drilling business that uh, my other colleague Ville Pohja will, will open more in detail to you later also in the presentation. Again, construction roughly 40% of our business. Here you see also on the left hand side the mineral exposure we have for drill and blast part of our business, for mining and quarrying part of our business. It's quite nicely split between, between the key minerals, and then you also see the split between the, the key applications, underground and surface mining, and, and other applications on the right-hand side for our kind of a mining type applications. Our track record. Okay, we have been able to stabilize after the challenges the company and have started a continuous improvement also with our financials. So we are back on growth track several quarters in a row, uh, growing compared to comparison period, and at the same time, driving our financial performance towards our strategic targets. So our strategy, key elements of it, so, the basic strategy hasn't changed. Our focus is clearly on top hammer and down the hole drilling consumables. Scope is clear. Focus is important in any business. What do you do it? Do it effectively and right. Be best at what you do. We look at some strategic cornerstones. We, we updated our strategic plans uh, end of last year, beginning of this year. And we we formed what we call strategic business areas. Ville Pohja here will represent one of the areas, geotechnical business. So we have three heads of strategic business areas that ensure that our plans and product development offering plans are market driven. Again, as we have stated earlier, the focus on growth and increasing sales coverage today will come through distribution partners. So we have and will uh, sign new distribution partners to increase our sales coverage. It's, it's, it's a key element of our growth. This is a service business. These products are critical to our customers' operations, and, and they have a continuous, continuous consumption of our consumables. Best-in-class availability is our target to ensure that you know, we, are, we are in a reliable way uh, able to deliver our products at the right, right time to our customers. And then on a, on a product development side, our strategic target is to offer best-in-class value to our customers. So building blocks, kind of an assets, capabilities we have that are key for driving uh, our company towards our big goal of 10% market share and our long-term strategic uh, financial targets of 15% organic growth and 13% EBITDA. Of course, people, our offering, supply chain, our sales, 
and the Robit way describing our business processes. People, of course, key in any business. Again, we have been able to build a really strong team of uh, thrilling consumable professionals. It's a global team with a lot of experience from the industry. We have 21 nationalities in eight countries. We have very strong sales-driven performance culture and continue to work and, and embrace that. And again, the values are the key element of driving the expectation we have to each other. So what are our think, focus areas to get stronger? We have had so-called Robit Talent program for a long time. We have a good amount of young talent that has been growing with the company. Again, Ville Pohja, who will be presenting later, is a good example of this. So we have a lot of growth within. So well, while the business is growing, uh, people are growing with the business. At the same time, we are adding some capabilities selectively. And again, George, George Apostolopoulos is a good example of that, an industry veteran that joined us beginning of this year. Knowledge development is, is in the core of what we do. We have very strong knowledge development programs and plans that are based on our strategic priorities. And we have been doing this already for a few years. Knowledge is really the key for sustainable competitiveness. We have built an incentive plan that is actually driving daily performance. I have seen a lot of these plans, and, and unfortunately, in many cases, people are looking at what happened at the end of the year. I think we have a clever solution which is impacting daily behavior. And uh, we continuously work on this uh, uh, mindset that, again, based on the value, drive change. How do we improve things in, in each of the functions? So again, we have a very strong team in place, a uh, global team with strong capabilities for, for, for our specific business. We have a high performance comprehensive offering. This is, of course, one of the key foundations for our business. So we have comprehensive offering for top hammer, down the hole, and down the hole geotechnical applications. We are able to serve our customers with everything that they need, with high quality products. And, and this, to develop this kind of a capability, it's, it's a long journey. So, how do we move towards even higher customer value? Again, we have formed the strategic business areas to ensure that all the development we do is really market and customer need driven. At the same time, we are moving more to value at type of uh, discussions with our customers. So we are creating a toolbox of performance service and, and different value at service aspects to, to our, our business. We have a very focused and kind of a networked uh, research and development agenda, uh, again, driving our product development to, towards that best in class value. Here we are working with the, the best people in the universities, different suppliers, and so on. So we pull where the best information or capabilities, where the best knowledge is for different areas. We have also so-called engineer to value initiatives. This means that sometimes design can be clearly smarter and cost competitiveness is, is, is taking like a step change. This is actually one of the key elements for driving our profitability currently. So we are able to, with engineering, to improve our cost competitiveness. Oops. Highly automated and scalable supply chain. So as I told you earlier, we have very modern factories in Finland, South Korea, Australia, and UK. High level of robotization and automation and good scalability in the current facilities. So how do we drive more competitive uh, 
more competitiveness and at the same time best in class availability target. We have a good investment roadmap, uh, let's say three years down the line, to, to, to be triggered and scale our production in the, in, the, in the current facilities. For profitability, we have still a lot to do in our material costs. So we are looking at new suppliers and at the same time increasing so-called cost competitive country share. While we continue to work with our current key partners, we, we will look for savings from so-called cost competitive countries. We have always a focus on short lead times, and, and this is the key KPI for any of our operations, and Arto will open these targets later in his presentation. And continuous productivity improvement is, is a culture. Actually, we have a good track record here. If you look at the growth we achieved first half of this year, our top hammer factories were breaking production records more or less month after month this year. Sales. Sales coverage is in place. We have a strong distribution network with good customer proximity. We have four markets where we have decided to go direct with a direct sales model. And of course, we have highest ambition level for these markets. And again, the strong team of uh, global team of uh, drilling consumable specialists. So how to capture the potential of our platform? Our focus is on growing actually with our current and new distributors and capturing the full potential of that platform. We use our direct markets also to develop concepts and service concepts for our distribution network. It's really important that we have these four markets where we are touching customers directly with our own teams. We have a very robust uh, distribution management distribution sales and pricing management processes in place, and we are driving towards excellence in sales. And again, continuous uh, capability development of our own team members and distributors team members in this consultative way of selling, helping customers to make right choices to reduce their operating costs. Business processes, uh, key element, uh, Arto will speak more about our ESG uh, initiative that we have built now during this year. Uh, all key business processes are, are developed and we have roadmaps for, for those. And, and we are operating under one common modern ERP that allows us to run the business based on facts. Our target setting, ESG, will be part of our daily work. Again, key business process for us for both networking capital management and, and this target of best-in-class availability is this order to delivery process that we continue to work on. Arda will talk more about that in his presentation. We are already and will be more and more so, very much a data-driven business. So we have good transparency to, to, to our, our data and models to drive the business quickly, if needed, to the right direction. And research and development, we work in networks, as I explained, created a model of, of pulling, pulling best capabilities from wherever it is. So as a summary, Robit has a very focused business model uh, and, and we purely focus on driving the current platform with organic growth towards our strategic targets. We have all the building blocks in place, organization, assets and capabilities uh, to implement these plans towards towards our, our financial targets. So, Daniel, time for some couple of questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tommy. I don't have any questions yet from the chat, so again, I remind you, please keep them coming. We'd really want those also from the online audience. But I believe we have a couple of questions 
All right, I think your hand up, up was, was first. Let's give the mic over there so also the online viewers get to hear your question. Please, sir. Thank you. It's uh, Erki from Inderes. Uh, regarding your geographical expansion, you've been talking about expanding the number of distributors in, say, West Africa, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, if I, I can recall it right. What are the next steps? Where does it stop? Or where, where do you see the biggest caps, gaps uh, in addition to these areas? Yeah, uh, you were mentioning Kazakhstan and West Central Africa, where we are kind of a already ramping up the businesses with, with those distributors. I think next big focus is, is, is North America for us. We have already initial steps taken there, but that's really the, the, the key target market for us. Okay, and then uh, regarding the customers that you're aiming at, is it easier to capture customers in the mining sector vis-a-vis -vis construction or where are you spe spearheading? Yeah, I mean, mining companies typically are large-size companies, but mines operate quite independently. So companies are more like holding companies and, and decisions are made in the mine, uh, mostly. But I would say mine and a large-size construction company may behave in many ways similar way, but the need is different because construction quite often is a project-type business while mining is a continuous operation in a single location. Then we have, of course, contractors, uh, what we call, let's say, mid-size contractors that can be, you know, 200 employees or so, and then small-size contractors of few people. So those are maybe the main customer profiles we have. Each customer requires its own approach. So regarding mining and construction, you are aiming at both, not either or? We are aiming at both. Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. I think we have time for still one question, if you, if you may. Can we... Thank you, Arto. Yes, this is Tom Skomer from Carnegie. Could you go to the, the slide with the financial targets? There. And while you are looking for that, I could just ask, hasn't the share of these two big companies been pretty flat the last 10 years? It's been around 50% throughout the last 10 year period, is that right? Yeah, based on these figures, you, oh, where, where, where I was. One back still. Yeah. One still, yeah. There no, 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 no. Hold on, this, this one. Yeah. This one, so, yes. so, Yeah, this is about, I mean, the, the, oh, okay. the yeah. market share, but so to my understanding, the market share has been very close to 50% the last 10 year period for the two big companies in the industry. Is that, is that right? Can you yeah, I would say you are right that if you look at our data, this kind of a rough, rough yeah. scale, scale has been there. I would say that while last two, three years, we have actually gained a lot more information and detail related to this split. But at the same time, we are, we are more focused on is talking about the addressable market. You know, we yeah. took the China and India out from, from this graph. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a, in a way even a coincidence that we end up with the two billion, but we have kind of a bottom up, top down views on it. And we are quite comfortable that with, with, the, with the reasonable accuracy, uh, the data is correct. Well, well, now when you start to get your own house in order, would it make sense to, to consolidate this field of others and, and or, or do you think that you know organic growth is the way to go? I mean, you could also be a compounder and, and, and you know start buying yeah. company after company, as it's still a very fragmented industry. It's a fragmented industry. I think uh, first of all, if you look at our current platform of sales teams and factories, we have so much untapped potential that we we should do that first, right? Because it's driving our profitability, keeping the the business focused and clean, yeah. and drive the performance up. There is a lot of overlapping things. So building quickly a, a, a consolidation through acquiring a lot of companies may end up in a mess yeah. also. So, so you need to be pretty selective in that type of processes. But then about these financial targets, because that was what I was going to ask. So you have an EBITDA margin target of 13%. I mean, I, I understand you have had that and you have had troubles with your profitability, but I'm kind of more thinking about, you know, this kind of ambition level. I mean, depreciation is like 5% of, of sales at mm. current sales levels. So that, that means you have a, an EBIT margin target of, of 8%, which is quite low in a, 
in a growing in a growth industry that is also capital intensive. I mean, it it, uh, it feels quite quite low. You know, I understand yeah. you are not there at the moment, but shouldn't you aim for more now when you have changed your your top line target yeah. as well? We are, we are not guiding excess schedule for for those targets. It's a good point you make. A uh, fair point. I think the board thinking has been also balancing on capturing the organic growth potential and profitability target. Yeah. So at this phase where our focus is growing fast, you know, do not squeeze the profitability target too tight yeah. to allow the growth. I'll have, to, I'll have to stop us here so that we just keep on. Keep on. Thank you for the question. Uh, this is what, exactly what I'm hoping to happen. Uh, but I think we will move on. And uh, Arto will definitely cover yeah. quite a few of these, uh, of these topics uh, in, in the later presentations. Thanks a lot for the, for the questions. Let's, let's get back to it. At this point, it's, uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to ask next on stage thank our... You, thank you, Tommy. Our group CFO, Arto Halonen, who will talk about Robit sustainability under the topic ESG in practice. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, welcome from my behalf as well. My name is uh, Arto Halonen, and I'm the CFO of the company. And uh, also, I'm responsible of the operations uh, for Robit. So ESG, uh, this is obviously an area that we have worked a lot also in the past. But this re year, we really wanted to crystallize Robit's vision, targets and roadmap when it comes to sustainability and, and ESG topics. Uh, the principle when we started the work was, was that we wanted it to be practical in a way that it, it touches the, and, and people at Robit can relate, to, that it touches the everyday work that we do at Robit. And uh, that's been kind of the guiding principle when we have set up our, our roadmaps. So at Robit, we want to be your partner for a more sustainable tomorrow. There are certain mega trends that are kind of supporting this ambition. For example, the electrification of the, of the world. And obviously, Robit, uh, we are part of that value chain and part of that change, you know, supporting our customers to produce, let's say, the required metals and minerals needed so that the world can, can uh, uh, electrify, let's, let's put it this way. One specific needs we work on is, is also this geothermal energy. Uh, and actually from business perspective, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that bit more. But it is also from sustainability aspect, uh, something where kind of our handprint is very positive, where we, where we help to build more sustainable methods of uh, uh, producing energy. And also kind of as a mega trend, they strive towards more sustainable infrastructure. So the four building blocks we kind of defined as, as be the cornerstones for, for Robit sustainability vision is firstly sustainable partnerships. We want to work with long-term partners, both upstream and downstream in our value chain, who share the same principles when it comes to sustainability as Robin. We target to reduce emissions in our own operations, but also more, more broadly in the, in the whole value chain. Thirdly, we want to be healthy and happy workplace for everyone at Robit and also partners we work with. And, and obviously safety is a very important topic on, on that aspect. And finally, we strive for efficiency throughout the product life cycle, from the design of the product all the way to the use at the customer side, and, and finally, you know, recycling the product. So let's look at these areas a bit more in detail. So our target is to have scope one and two emission intensity by 2030, baseline year being uh, year 2020. The starting point is 36.9 tons of CO2 equivalents per million euro of net sales. Majority of our emissions 
come from uh, the electricity we use at our factory locations, and obviously that's, that's where uh, a lot of our actions will be aimed at. So we plan to increase the share of renewable energy sources used at our factories and also look at the energy efficiency uh, of our factory locations and also other locations, obviously, but, but the vast majority of the emissions comes from the uh, production units. And then uh, kind of as a next development stage, we want to start to expand and understand better the, the kind of the CO2 emissions in the logistics chains as well. The initial focus now is on our scope one and two emissions. Secondly, we value materials and products throughout the uh, whole life cycle. What does this mean? When we design the products, we try to design them as energy efficiency as possible, uh, both at the use, uh, at the customer side, but also then on the production state. On the production stage, we want to uh, aim to minimize uh, the uh, amount of scrap, for example, and uh, finally at the customer side where customers are using and operating our products, we want to help them to use them in an optimal way, in an energy efficient way. So the targets, KPIs we have set in this category uh, is firstly to increase the waste recovery ratio to over 90% uh, in our factory locations. And then as a second target, something we strongly believe in, uh, consultative sales training that we aim to have more than 1,000 hours for Robit people or Robit distributor network people. And what do we mean when we talk about consultative sales? I'll, I'll give you one example, one case study. This is a case uh, in a quarry in Finland and uh, Kind of the starting point, the initial phase was that uh, the drilling parameters that customer was using were not optimal and the fuel consumption in the drilling process was, was high and also there were kind of uh, excess heat generated in the drilling process. Robit expert went to the site, worked with the customer, optimized the drilling parameters and as a result the fuel consumption significantly dropped. At the same time, the drilling performance, the uh, kind of the rate of penetration got better and there was less heat generated. To put this into scale, if you convert this fuel saving on an annual basis to emissions, you would need to optimize in a similar manner 31 drill rigs, so 31 similar uh, cases, and that corresponds to Robit's total scope 1 and 2 emissions in 2020. So that's why this is an area that we really believe in. This has a big leverage, and knowledge is a key in this, and, and that's why this consultative sales is, is a target KPI that we have also set for ourselves. We want to be healthy and happy workplace. Safety is obviously a topic that we have put a lot of focus also in the past. And it's very important in the industries uh, we work in. It's kind of your license to, to operate. Another aspect that kind of is a strength and, and what we are quite proud of at, at Robit is the diversity at, at Robit. Uh, for example, only in Finland where we have just a bit more than 60 people, we have 10 different nationalities working for Robit. And, and we tr truly believe that that's a kind of a value for us and, and uh, it is something that we aim to nurture also in the future. Targets that we have on these areas are, are improving a people power index, which is a basically a, a employee satisfaction measurement we have done on an annual basis and we aim to improve on that metric every year. And as a second target, uh, we target zero, zero loss time injuries.
We build transparent and sustainable long-term relationships. So Tommy talked a lot about the distributor network, and that's really, we, we consider it at the same fa family. Same with our suppliers. We want to build long-term relationships with our partners and with partners who share the same principles that we do when it comes to sustainability and, and ESG topics. So here we, we will target to have more than 90% both the distributors and suppliers we work with uh, uh, commit to the kind of the ESG principles that, that we have. So, Robit, Robit is your partner for a more sustainable tomorrow. And we have these four key building blocks that we base it on. The sustainable partnerships, reducing CO2 emissions, healthy and happy workplace, and efficiency throughout the product life cycle. Now, time for, for some questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Arto, for that presentation. And uh, first, I just want to comment to online. I see, saw a couple of questions that came in, and, uh, and I think I will save them to the Q&A in the end. There was one question, for example, about the acquisitions and also about personnel, so I'll save those up because they were not really on sustainability. I believe we have a question here. All right, let's take from the front row, please. Yeah, hi, it's uh, Antti from SAB. Just a very basic question on the recyclability of, of, of your drill bits. So what happens to the bits when they are end of their lifetime at the customer side? How, how recyclable are, are, the, uh, are the products after that? Yeah, obviously, you know, what, what our products mainly are, they are steel. And, and steel is a kind of a material stream that is, that is very well recycled, uh, all in all. I think where there could be improvements uh, in, in recycling is, is these carbide buttons that you have, uh, have on the, on the uh, uh, drill bits. That's, that's one thing. But on the hammers, the other products, you know, they are generally uh, very well recyclable. And mostly customers take care of the recycling themselves. Okay, and then secondly, on the uh, example that you showed and, and, and broadly on the uh, consultative sales process, which type of customers are you actually working with? Is it this kind of a smaller contractors or is this something that, for example, the mining industry is asking for you to be more kind of proactive in, in achieving energy savings in the uh, drilling phase? So could you open up a little bit? What, what are your ambitions and how the business is today? Yeah, yeah there are obviously different type of customers and for some you know this kind of optimization work could be very much a focus internally as well but there's a plenty of customers where it not doesn't necessarily is that way isn't necessarily like this way so it can be a smaller contractor but i think it can be very well a a kind of a larger companies maybe where the knowledge level of the of the employees is not necessarily as high as in as in some other areas and generally, you know, this is a very good area where the economic aspects for the customer and the sustainability aspects, they are 100% aligned. Because, you know, this, this translates into, you know, lower cost per meter uh, for the customer. So, you know, you don't necessarily approach this from sustainability uh, angle, but there's still a strong motivation with customers to work, work on these aspects. All right, thank you. Good. I'll, if you can save your question so that we, we keep a bit on schedule, unfortunately, so we'll take it up at that point. Thanks a lot, Arto. Thank you. And at this point, it's my great pleasure to ask next on stage our uh, VP of Global Sales, George Apostolopoulos. So, George, the stage is yours. Good morning and welcome to all of you. First of all, uh, you guys, you're physically present. Secondly, our online audience. My name is George Apostolopoulos. Apologies for the long, difficult surname. Uh, I had the, the global sales for Robit since last December, so pretty fresh in the company. And um, 
I've been in this industry for a little bit over 20 years. Partner in mining, and uh, why mining? Mining is a sizable and uh, still lucrative business. There is a continuous positive outlook. Uh, the customers are pretty much loyal compared to, to construction, for example. Uh, there is a steady uh, demand for drilling consumables, even in, when, the, when the capex is, is low. There is um, a better planning, a better, product, a better product demand forecasting, which of course helps our production planning. There is a financial strength, and that of course helps our payments. We receive the payments quicker, and it, pre it presents a, a very strong reference for Robit going forward. Electrification drives growth, and if, if we want to take a macro view on, on the commodities demand for the next 20 years, an outlook on the outlook there, there is, there is a clear trend from, from coal to copper. The coal is on the decline. There is some stability when it comes to, to steel, iron ore, lead and zinc. And of course, what's, what's up it is, is copper, is nickel, is cobalt and lithium. Of course, metal scraps, um, high quality steel. This is driven mainly, I mean, the, the, the demand for these metals is driven by electric vehicles and other gadgets like this. There will be a 50 billion, actually 50 trillion uh, US dollars investment in the next 30 years uh, for, to, to, get, to get these, um, these metals to, to produce, to be produced, that I, I mentioned earlier. Moreover, there will be a 1.7 trillion US dollar investment from the mining companies for, for these um, minerals to come out of, of the earth. And this is what will lead to a low carbon world, because this is the trend. Another mega trend that we, we observe, of course, is urbanization. Two out of three people by 2050 will be living in, in urban areas. And that's very important. So we're in a, in a strong commodity cycle. So high demand drives high pricing, of course. And then this demand is in turn driven by supply chain and price predictability. Mining will grow 3 to 5%, and this is driven mainly by underground mining. As we, we said before, the growth is driven by minerals which are related to decarbonization or electrification. And uh, underground mining is, is growing faster than surface mining. And this is because there is higher, higher grades, less ore processes, and s less or smaller environmental risks. So the underground mining will grow by 4 to 5%. And this is from drilling for nickel. This is from drilling in copper, not iron ore. There is investment in ESG, sustainability, and this is with a focus to decarbonization, energy efficiency, and this is what we call the social improvement. Now, artificial intelligence, digitalization, and electrification are there to improve safety, and what is more important for us is to improve production and productivity in drilling. Robit matching mining customer needs. You know, the mining, the mining customers are very particular. They have certain characteristics and certain needs. And um, the characteristics as follows, they are, they're big in size. They have continuous operations. Their fleet, their equipment is always on site. In other words, in the mine. And they're high expenditure customers. Their needs, safety, sustainability, services, local stock, and relationship. How do we, do we in Robit address these needs? First of all, focus. For others, drilling consumables is a part of their business. For us, it's our business. That's very important. Flexibility. We have increased capabilities in selecting the right product. Number three, Services, and we talk about product trials. We talked about swift response times. We talk about ring grinding bits, drill master support. Quality, as, as our CEO even mentioned earlier, this is never going to be a compromise. It's a strategic direction. Our product will always be quality product. Last but not least, customer centricity. So 
Our distributors are extended robot family. That's how we see them, that's how we treat them. And then we have experienced teams for direct sales. This, this brings me to my next slide, my next slide, which is, this is our model. We operate with a very strong distributor network and a dedicated direct-to-market approach for selected markets. At the moment, 55% of our business comes from our distributor network and 45% from direct markets. Now, distributor network, how do we select our distributors? What is in there? We make sure they're very close to customer. It's very, very important. And of course, there are product portfolio synergies. So the drilling consumable must be complementing the rest of the product portfolio. Secondly, they need to have financial capabilities, financial strength. This is needed for investing in both resources and stock. Next, commitment to a common business plan. We sit down and before we sign them up, we sign them up, actually, we draw a business plan. Commonly, we sign up and we follow it up on a regular basis. There is a collaboration and focus to win accounts, and that's how we work. It's a hard, systematic work. It's account by account. Simple. I would say the old-fashioned way, but that's what it works. And last but not least, commitment. Commitment in the Robit brand. If we go to the, our direct sales markets. These are four, as we mentioned before, Finland, South Africa, Peru, and Australia. There is high ambition level from these markets. We have very experienced people with drilling consumables background in these markets. They, th these, are, these are the markets that we basically develop together with the customer always service concepts that are aimed at reducing the, the total drilling cost. And this is where we benchmark. And you know, the successful, the proven offerings and service concepts, we use them, we utilize them for the distribution network. Very, very important. Excellence in distributor management. And this is how we basically support our distributors. We have Distributors Net. That's a platform with a lot of sales and marketing material. All distributors, when they sign up, they get their credentials, they have access to, to, to this material. Uh, Robit Online is an online system, as the name implies. Again, all distributors, when they do sign up, they have direct access to it. They can see price for products, availability. They can even place orders. Trainings. We do technical trainings regularly for our distributors and on uh, trainings on consultative sales, which is very important. Um, drill master support. Since there is a, I would say, a high expertise within the company, we, we offer drill master support either physically or remotely. That's for our distributors. We have dedicated, dedicated sales teams and customer service teams that help, help them, help them on, the, on, a, on a global basis. And then back to the common action plan, there is a continuously monitored sales funnel. This is what we monitor together with the distributors. Uh, the world map with uh, some nicely spread dots there. These are representing tier one distributors. These are some examples. I think there's some 25 on the map. I will, I will pick on two. One is a company called BIA. It's a Belgian-based company operating in West, French-speaking West Africa, all the way down, down to Zambia. They are the Komatsu dealer. They have been the Komatsu dealer for close to 30 years. And um, they are also the Furukawa dealer, drilling machines, drilling rigs. So you see there the synergies and the, what I said before about complementing the product. These guys, they have salespeople, they have technicians, they're in and out on the, on, on the mine on a 24-7 basis, working three shifts, two, three shifts, depending on the mine. So synergies are very obvious. Similarly, Eurasian Machinery, that's uh, our exclusive distributor in Kazakhstan, very big mining market. We signed them last April, um, exclusive Hitachi dealer for both Russia and Kazakhstan, close to 650 people staff. They have workshops in three or four big cities in, in mining cities in, in Kazakhstan. And of course, same thing, big synergies. They're always into the mine. 
these are the kind of dealers we, we, we really like and want to work with. A couple of success stories. One is from our direct markets, and this is the first one is from a mine in the north of Finland, Kitila Agneko Eagle, the customer, a contract of five plus two years. We, we started in May, last May. Typically, these contracts range between 1 to 1.5 million euro per year. Um, what was the problem? Excessive wear of the bits, and you know, changing them, changing them very frequently posed a threat, a safety hazard. So, how did we succeed? We, we offered uh, diamond seri series bits, which are more durable, for sure. Um, drill master expertise and then local service present with regrinding, getting customer feedback and uh, customer demands and the, custom and the drill master feedback. And that's how you know, we convince the customer that with local presence and you know, good offering, you, you can really get where you want to go. Second success story is from our distributors. This is Codelco, Chile, the biggest copper mine in the world. And this is a, our dealer full safety in Chile. This is a three-year contract. It's higher than 1.5 million a year. Um, the contract started in 2020. Why we got in there? Performance, availability, and very, very important for mining customers, relationship. In a nutshell, partner for mining. Why? Stable demand for drilling consumables globally. For Robi, this is a, a very high potential to increase our market share. Mining customers have very special needs. We know them and we address them. And the way we do this is through a very strong distributors network and selected direct-to-markets approach. Thanks very much for your attention. Now over to you, Daniel, for, for questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, George. Yes, excellent. We have. Uh, we don't have anything in the chat. I'll uh, I'll turn it over to here. Do we have the mic, uh, Arto? May you please to the front row first. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, this is Tom Skoma from Carnegie. So you said you came was it 2019 to Robit, but you have been 20 years in the industry. So wh who have you worked for before, and and what uh, what uh, kind of are the top three changes that you have implemented? Thanks for the question. Uh, I joined uh, Robit last December, so it is December 2020. Uh, I worked for Epiroc, or what used to be Atlas Copco, until the split for 18 years. Um, when it comes to implementation, um, the most important thing is that we uh, have signed up, if I remember well, four or five distributors the last, uh, the first, part, first half of the year. Um, this is the major, major markets. One is in uh, Eurasian machinery. We have signed a couple of other ones. And um, I think what is a main thing that we try to pass to our teams, you know, we have eight sales areas across the world and we, we work with the local teams and the, these are experienced drillers, experienced people. So in essence, what we're doing is we're assisting with with expertise, the, the problem so far, I mean, this year has been COVID and, you know, we have not been, been really able to travel and meet customers. The consultative sales is, I would say, something which is being implemented and this is important because when we, when we go meet customers ourselves or our distributors, we want to be able to, to go in and, and speak not only to the procurement people, we want to speak to engineers and that's extremely important in our business. So this is where the consultative sales help. Good. All right, I believe we have another question there. Please, if we can get the mic over there so online audience can hear as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, Erki from Interest again. Uh, my hunch is that you guys are from time to time in the process of replacing a weaker performing distributor to a better one. How easy is it for you to, to change the distributor? I mean, in terms of cost and time span, etc. What, what kind of contracts do you have with them? Thank you for the question. Yes, we do have contracts with them. Um, it's not an easy process. You, you're very right. So we don't really aim at changing the distributors like overnight. It is, a, it is an expensive process. It takes time and it's not always successful. 
So, I mean, the cost, the cost of changing a distributor and, and replacing what he's already, they're already doing, it's, it's really high. So, we prefer to go even exclusive in big markets. We, we're looking for exclusive, financially strong distributors that can really do the, the work for us. So, I agree with you 100%. Changing distributors is not the way forward. We want to maintain what we have and ramp up, work with them the best way possible. Of course, in, in new markets, yes, we, we, we would go for new distributors. Just to uh, continue on that, uh, how satisfied are you with your current distributor network? Do you have any, currently any, any needs to re replace somebody I, out there? Mm -hmm. As I said, I think at this moment we're satisfied and it's most important for us to ramp up and work and improve, grow with the, with the existing platform. I don't think it's a, it, is a, it is a special need to, to get more distributors. We need to, to take a step at a time. So we have a very nice platform, a very good platform in key markets, good distributors. We need to start getting more business with them. That's the strategy. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. George. All right. I'll then move us onwards. And next, it's my great pleasure to ask on stage our VP of geotechnical side, Ville Pohja. Stage is yours, Ville. Thank you, Daniel. Hello everyone, my name is Ville Pohja, I'm the Vice President of Geotechnical Business. I've been in Robit since 2015, so a bit of a Robit veteran, we can say, as you can see from my grey hair. Uh, what is geotechnical business? Uh, from the down the whole business that we publicly report, geotechnical business um, represents about half of the down the whole business. There are two major parts in this geotechnical business, but also some other applications. So piling, geothermal well drilling, water well drilling, anchoring, and horizontal drilling. In this presentation, I'm mostly going to focus on down the whole piling, because at the moment it's the most significant part. So I'm going to open up the nature of this business to you. And at the end, a little bit about the, the growing geothermal market we have. So what is piling? Piling is an essential part in the modern construction. Due to urbanization, most of the easiest places have already been built on, so what remains is the more unstable soil that often then requires piling. So down the hole piling is a method of installing steel piles and casing by using the robot down the hole drilling solutions. Uh, it's still a bit of a niche uh, method, there are a lot of different ways of operating piling. The, the most typical ones you see on the slide, pile boring, which you eventually have an auger type of tool to peel off the, the layers of the soil. Or driven piles, which are quite common here, also in Scandinavia everywhere, where you have concrete piles or steel piles, which are basically hammered by force. So these... <laughs> most common type of, uh, of piling methods. They work well in easy conditions, but when we go all the time more into more difficult ones, they start to have difficulties. And that is why a type of piling, down the hole piling, have been developed. So we go to the, to the benefits. Down the hole piling works in all conditions. When the site investigation shows that there's going to be rock, there's going to be difficult conditions, what the, the designer can design then down the whole piles and they can be sure that the process is reliable, they can, they can install the piles like it's been planned and uh, moreover it's extremely predictable and they save a lot of time. We can say that the more difficult and more rock they have in the project, the more time is saved and the more money is saved by using down the whole piling. Here are some examples of our uh, key customers. So we m work with some of the, the, the biggest customers in, in the construction industry uh, if they are operating with their own fleet of drill rigs. N not all of the big companies operate in this way. In some cases, they might have subsidiaries, uh, other companies that, that operate in the infrastructure uh, ground, ground working space. But there are also some uh, quite, quite small uh, operators were then specialized in, in piling and, and drilling works. So what do our customers do? Uh, the typical projects can be infrastructure projects like bridges, 
uh, harbors, dry docks, quays are quite, quite typical at the moment. Lo a lot of large construction projects uh, like skyscrapers, arenas. Now, for example, in Tampere, the Tampere Uros Live Arena is, is one reference. Malls like the Mall of Tripla and Ready, they have been all uh, built with down the hole piles. Factory buildings like Metza Fiber at the moment is building, investing into a huge bioproduct factory in Kemi. And that's been one of our biggest down the hole piling job sites in Finland this year. Uh, server halls for Facebook and Google and so on. But it's not only the big ones. Uh, it can be basically any size of construction project, even, even smaller housing, if it's in difficult ground conditions. Like here in Helsinki, uh, areas like Kalasatama or Jätkäsaari, more or less everything built and that will be built have been drilled. The piles have been drilled because the, uh, the ground conditions are so difficult. Uh, typical projects for us. So our customers they tender for the piling projects, uh, the project, and we tender for the tools for the customer. The project values are typically between 10 and 100,000 euros, but the biggest might be even a, a million or two million euros. But in this business, we operate through distributors in the same way as in the other businesses. Uh, so we do get steady revenue for the distributors who are having the local stock for the local market and the most typical tools there. So it's, it's not, not so cyclical as it might sound. The biggest markets at the moment we see are Nordics, Russia and North America. Uh, Russia as kind of like a new, new market, basically started from zero, but in uh, Nordics is kind of like the pioneer of, of this type of uh, piling. Robit market share is fairly high in down the hole piling. So a lot higher than in any other applications where we work in. And that's because this is a bit of a niche business still. And the market potential, what we saw in the, in the slides previously, is not as high at the moment as, as, as in, for example, mining. So we talk about the range of 100, 150 million. But uh, anyway, it's because of the demand, it's been quite steadily growing all the time. So the growth that we see is coming um, from the growing market, n not so much in the growing market share for Robit. We typically operate uh, project by project, but with some of the bigger customers we, we have and, and try to have yearly contracts to secure the business. So why is the demand growing? Like said, urbanization, easiest place have already been built on, uh, we need to build more and more in the same places. All the easiest places have already been built. There is more demand to build on difficult ground. And then one other thing is that this method is still fairly young. Uh, the first down the hole piling projects have been drilled, let's say, 15, 20 years ago. And during the last five and 10 years, there's been a steady growth. And the designers, the contractors are more, more and more um, accepting this method as a, as a very effective way to work in the, in the difficult ground condition projects. Like I said, the nature of the business is project business, so when the customer wins a project, they, they need the products extremely fast. We need to have a lot of flexibility, fast deliveries. Uh, typically, the most common items for the, for the market are in stock, the low value ones, but the bigger ones, like this huge bit in, in this picture, uh, 1.4 meter bit, of course, is then a make to order, which we start producing uh, from the purchase order. What is the Robit competitive edge? Uh, in this kind of a niche business, true experts are actually quite rare, and we can really add value to the, to the customer. Uh, we have pretty good pr proximity at the moment for the key market, so we do benefit, for example, in Scandinavia, that our fact in, in freights and delivery times that our factories are, are quite close to the market. Uh, in the bigger project with the newer customers, of course, references, they play a role, and when you're one of the biggest players like we are with strong references, it's, of course, our benefit. Uh, like I said, we have very strong distributors, 
in, in this business uh, with a lot of expertise, service capability and complementing offer. And, and actually, I, I think still today, the biggest distributor for Robit in total is a geotechnical distributor. So we, in, in certain areas, the, this, this business is a very significant size. Uh, that's piling, and then a few words about geothermal wells. Geothermal wells offer renewable energy, decreases CO2 footprint. And at the moment, uh, here in Robit, we are focusing more in the Scandinavian uh, geothermal wells, as that alone is quite a big market. So in Scandinavia, 60 to 70,000 geothermal wells are drilled every year. The number is growing all the time. And actually, there's, there's lack of drillers at the moment. Everyone is busy at, at, at the end of the year. Uh, so we evaluate that uh, the geothermal wells in Scandinavia alone is a, is a 30 million euro market that we are now targeting. We have been in this market uh, for a long time, but only with a pretty narrow scope of the product offering. And since the acquisitions, we've been started to develop uh, the full offering to offer for the drillers. So that, that is where we see a good, good growth opportunity. And as opposed to piling, where we need to offer a pretty wide range of products because the designer basically determines what needs to be installed in the ground. In geothermal wells, uh, in Scandinavia, we work more or less with the same standard products all the time. So this is a good thing that we can, with an attack, with a pretty narrow product offering and, and high volumes into, into this market. So as a summary, what I would like everyone to remember uh, for the geotechnical business, Robit is a strong player in the constantly growing uh, down the hole piling business, and we see a good opportunity to grow in the Scandinavian geothermal business. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ville. Uh, yes, all right, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Just a side note, I saw that there were a couple of questions on mining uh, online in the chat. I'll save those also for the Q&A for our team, so they will be addressed at that point. Can we get, the, I think the hand was up first here in the first row, please. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, Antti from SCB. Uh, you mentioned the cyclicality and, and the project aspect of, of the appiling business. So how does that actually work for your distributors? Are they usually a very strong kind of a local player? So they are not very dependent on a, uh, winning a single uh, project and such. So how, how much volatility is there kind of for their inventory levels and the standard products that you provide for, for, for the distributors? Um, it depends, but mostly we have uh, quite strong and, and uh, big size distributors in, in this business. But of course, depending on the market size, there are, there are different kinds. So if I understand correctly, kind of the volatility for you is maybe winning or losing a, a bigger 1 million, 2 million project and, and kind of the more customized, bigger products that you are delivering and kind of the standard business is fairly, fairly even compared to the market growth. Yeah, to be honest, there hasn't been a lot of volatility because anyway, there's, there's a, a lot of rotating standard items all the time and these kind of one, two million big one-off deals are kind of like addition. And we've been anyway be able to grow all the time. So I would say that, you know, it's, it's pretty steady, even like in a monthly basis for us and, and the distributors. Okay, and then lastly, from the uh, Scandi uh, geothermal market, I mean, wh wh what's your kind of a market position? What's the competitive edge? Are you just seeing a, a big market growth potential, or is, this, is there mm -hmm. something to be done to strengthen your, your share in that market? I think this, this is a very interesting market because it's extremely quality driven. So the contractors are small contractors. They typically need to drill a, a one deep well on a day, so they cannot afford to take chances with their drilling tools. So like a high quality product is extremely essential in this geothermal market. And I would say that uh, the customers, that, that is their you know, top, top, top thing, what they think about when they, when they choose their supplier. 
Okay. And where are you in this process? So is there still convincing to be done that you are a top quality provider or are you already there? I, I, I would say that we are in a, in a very good position at the moment with the, with the process that we have. Our, our market share is growing all the time and our name and brand is, is getting more known in the areas we haven't been before. Okay, Thanks good. so much. I'll pass it on to still one short question from over there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Erk, again from Indres. Uh, coming back to piling, how tight is the competition there and how much pricing leeway do you have? I mean, if it's a pretty sp specific uh, business area and you're strong there, you should reap pretty nice margins out there. Yeah, the, the, the most, there are some differences that in, um, in the bigger sizes maybe it's different because not everyone can supply that, that sort of uh, equipment and typically delivery times and the, the references, these sort of things uh, play a bigger role. But in the smaller sizes, the more common sizes, of course, uh, it's easier to compete and there is more competition there. So the more common the product or, or bigger the market, of course, that's how business works. There's always more competition. Okay, thanks. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ville. Thank you. All right. Next, we will move on. And there's going to be two back-to-back -back, uh, presentations from Arto again. He has multiple roles, of course, today. And uh, we'll have a Q&A in between. Because first, Arto will be talking about uh, the best-in-class service level and then the plan in numbers. But uh, let's get started first on the service level. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Tommy mentioned in the in the opening presentation that one of the key cornerstones for our strategy is to build robot capability to be able to provide best-in-class service level in this industry. So let's look a bit closer to the topic. So we are in service business and in service business availability, lead times, reliability, those really are key success factors. And uh, how we approach this, there are three, let's say, main elements that uh, we want to address. Firstly, flexible manufacturing capacity. You know, we need to have capability to manage the peaks and valleys of the, of the demand, as demand is not always, always stable. Integrated supply chain planning. You know, the whole supply chain from the customer side all the way to the raw material purchase. That is a long chain and we need to master in managing that. And thirdly, offering management. You know, we need to make wise decisions already when we design the products, we design our product ranges, manage our product offering. And obviously that, that will then translate how easy, difficult it is to provide best in class service level and availability. So in this kind of uh, service business, we need to keep lead time short. And, and therefore, we have set a target for ourselves that are kind of a guiding principles when, when we define our investment plans and define our kind of practices at the factories, that we need to have 25% flexible or free capacity to cope with the peak demands. Because there are, you know, we are working in a relatively stable business environment, but still you have peaks and valleys in the demand. You win a new customer, you need to ramp up a new customer, and, and then, uh, then it can generate a kind of a peak load uh, at, at one given month or week. How do we do this? Is that I think one aspect is that we need to look carefully into our investment roadmap. So we don't get caught kind of having... A, shortage of machining capacity. Uh, same applies obviously to the supplier network that we have also the supplier network aligned with the plans. And then we need to have the flexibility maybe through you know, shift planning, through uh, flexible working arrangements at our factories that we can adjust the capacity uh, if we see higher than normal demand coming. 
And kind of with these actions, we target to keep from the manufacturing units our lead times for high runner products in less than three weeks. Obviously, we then provide a kind of a local availability through our sales entities, distributors in the world, but from the manufacturing units, which is the kind of the first stage, this is our target. 2021, we have uh, done a lot of investments are, and are still implementing, and, uh, and we will continue to do these investments in 2022 to be ready for the growth. Let's look more closely the expansions, especially on the top hammer side. So in Lempala factory, we did a study end of last year, uh, kind of really aiming how we can significantly increase the capacity from our Lempala factory. And uh, now we are implementing the first steps of that investment plan. There are two product areas that Lempala is supporting and manufacturing. For the top hammer side, the top hammer bits, and then the geotechnical products Ville was just uh, uh, giving a presentation about. This, uh, both of the product areas uh, were previously on a one factory building. We have two buildings at, at Lempala. The other one was in warehouse use and the other one as a kind of a production use. So what we are now doing is that we are moving the geotechnical production to the other building that used to be, uh, let's say, the uh, warehouse, and we have invested to free up the space to a new warehouse building. So essentially, we will have a geotechnical factory and we will have a top hammer factory. At the same time we are doing this move, we are also investing into more machining capacity on the geotechnical production. We have invested into a new drilling cell and essentially on this kind of a key production stage we are we are doubling the uh, machining capacity similarly on the top hammer side where we have seen great growth uh, we freed up as a result of this move a lot more space for current and future growth and we have done investments into new uh, production cells also in, uh, in the top hammer side, and we'll continue to do that in uh, 2022. The Lempala investments will be completed by the end of this year, and, and we'll have the uh, uh, capacity up and running by that. And, and you see still on the slide that on the top hammer pit production, this means more than 30% capacity increase already, the investments that are under implementation as we speak. Korea factory is our another top hammer factory. Uh, Korea, this is a new factory established in uh, 2018. And straight from the beginning, there was a kind of a long-term investment roadmap uh, for the Korea factory. And this investment roadmap, we are now implementing as demand is growing. It's essentially producing, kind of uh, completing the top hammer offering that Lempala is manufacturing in Korea. We do drill rods, shanks and couplings. And uh, essentially the uh, drill rods and shanks are the key, key product areas there. And on both of these, we are doing uh, big investments to, to improve the capacity, increase the capacity. On the drill rock production, we are investing into a new friction welding machine and opening up a kind of a Porolnik in, in the current production. And this will uh, improve, in, increase the capacity for drill rod production. This investment will be up and running beginning of uh, 2022. Similarly, on the shank production, we are investing into a new machining tools and also kind of we are robotizing uh, the or increasing the robotization in the production. This is in general kind of our principle is that in all of the investments we aim for high level of automation, uh, high use of robots to kind of increase the productivity in our factories. And, and this is, uh, has been one kind of a key aspect also 
in the investment on the Sank production line in Korea. And we'll get more than 20% capacity increase for the Sank production. On top of that, we built kind of a more uh, supplier capacity close to the close to the Korea factory. Another key aspect uh, is this integrated supply chain planning. So, uh, as I was saying, you know, the whole supply chain, let's say from a mining customer at Peru who needs to have the products available to local stoking in, in Peru, to transportation, manufacturing and raw material purchase, that is a kind of a fairly long uh, supply chain value chain. And, and managing this chain is one of the most critical tasks and maybe even one of the most complex tasks in, in our business, where we need to really succeed in order to be able to provide best-in-class availability. And we've been kind of on a journey to really master, master this uh, uh, process, and there's been a lot of development done already in the past years. We've been uh, establishing processes for inventory planning, forecasting process. At the same time, we've been um, establishing, let's say, global planning team who is managing this process, working closely with the sales to gather the sales forecast and, and to, let's say, manage availability on an item by item level. We've done investments on kind of targeted digital tools to make the internal processes more efficient, smarter and more accurate. And uh, kind of most recently to this whole process, we've, we've integrated the raw material planning, which is obviously kind of the last or the longest chain we have is that that's really an area where we need to succeed because if you fail in planning your raw material needs, then it's going to be slow to react uh, if the demand is higher than anticipated. So, so that is uh, really critical that it's integrated to the whole process. What we are doing next is that now we are doing uh, investment into, let's say, state-of-the-art inventory planning, forecasting uh, software that will support the process we already have in place, but will just make it faster more intelligent, more proactive, and, and as a result, we'll, we'll get better results uh, in, in uh, this area. But really, really important area in this whole availability management. The third key aspect is uh, our offering. So we need to do smart decisions already at the design table. And really, we are in a kind of a mass customization uh, business and, and we drive to have modular product designs. Here is a one great example from the recently launched Arbit product series, which is uh, our drill bit, uh, new drill bit series. In the, well, let's say if you, in the manufacturing process, what you do first, you machine the body of the drill bit before the heat treatment and after that you'll drill the holes for the buttons and, and uh, put the carbide buttons and there can be different type of face types for example depending on the application you are selling or you have different carbide grades so kind of the product is a, is a kind of a configurable product in that sense. In, in our previous older product range for each in this example, it's one size class product. For each uh, of the different, let's say, configurations, there was also unique bit body, which was the first stage in the production. And obviously it means that we need to, if we want to provide fast availability, we would need to keep, in this case, six, six different blocks available and, and, and it has impact on the, on the inventory levels and so forth. But now in the R bit, the design is smarter and all of the kind of different configuration can be manufactured from one bit body. And also the number of different configurations have been 
reduced, but still we are able to meet the customer requirements in different applications. And obviously this translated to, into more efficient supply chain as a whole. Uh, we can better manage our availability, we can provide better lead times. And, and these initiatives are really key in, in building this best-in-class availability in, in our business. And uh, RBD is one great example uh, in this area. So as a summary, we target to keep 25% flexible free capacity to manage peak demands. We develop, continue to develop the processes, supporting tools for the inventory planning and forecasting. And modularity is key in driving our product design. Good. Thank you, Arto. Let's pause here for a while, give you a bit of a breather and, and a bit of questions and answers. I'll first take uh, one question from, from the chat that just came in. There was a question that, are there plans for a European central warehouse for all product ranges in the future? No, we don't have currently plans. I think today, you, where, from where we serve European customers is uh, from uh, Lempala factory, or sometimes directly delivering from our other, other factories. But Lempala acts essentially like as a uh, uh, regional warehouse for, for uh, European customer needs and distributor needs. Excellent. Thank you. Then can we have the mic over here in the front row? Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Just a question on the uh, kind of the capacity investments that you are doing. And I mean, you are seeing growth, the market is growing, you are seeking to gain market share, so obviously you are in a growth phase. But how much of these investments that you are making is to kind of improve your flexibility and improve kind of the lead times and, and cash conversions and such? So what I'm trying to get is that is this a uh, anticipation of a, a strong or structural growth period or is it just, you know, improving your flexibility and, and, and kind of giving more kind of a leeway to those fluctuations that you are seeing? I think there's both aspects included here. I think uh, uh, essentially, let's pick an example, I guess it's always easiest with that. Like for example, when we do the investments in the uh, uh, shank manufacturing in Korea, you know, as a result of the investment, we can do bigger portion in house and always always when you need to do you know some stages maybe out outside of the factory premises it increases the lead time and as a result obviously the money is tied longer so the fast throughput time is definitely helped uh, with the investments but there is a big component that these investments are really to build capacity for growth and, and to be honest I think we would have wanted to have some of this capacity online already earlier because we have seen very strong growth uh, in, in Top Hammer and, uh, and you know uh, therefore these, these investments are meeting the demand we've seen already and building further capacity for the future future growth. And is this kind of the lack of this capacity previously, is this something that has led of losing business or is it just a slower conversion to revenues and cash flows? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, it's d difficult to estimate, but definitely I think you could say that we haven't been at our target levels when it comes to the lead times and so forth this year. And, and this is a service business and sometimes if you don't meet the customer expectation, uh, in terms of the product lead time, you lose business. So I would say, yeah, there's been some business we have lost uh, uh, during this year because uh, we haven't been able to supply as fast as, as possible. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you very much. I'll have to stop us here so that we keep on schedule. Uh, we'll save your question for later. And also I saw that there was a chat uh, question on, uh, on the down the hole versus top hammer growth. That's an excellent question that I'll also save for the Q&A in the end. At this point, I'll, uh, 
unleash you again on the plan of numbers. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So, yeah, I'll, I'll try to conclude a bit what we have discussed uh, so far uh, and, and put some kind of numbers and, and direction behind, behind that. So, just as a recap, our financial targets, so what we are striving towards is this 15% uh, organic growth annually and comparable EBITDA of 13%. And you see the development we've had, we've been trending to right direction, uh, but we are not uh, yet there where, where uh, our ambition level is or our long-term targets are. So how we plan to narrow and narrow the gap and eventually uh, reach our long-term strategic targets. If you look at the key drivers for growth and profitability, let's start from the growth. We've been talking here today about this distributor channel development. George talked that we have, we already have, we have recently signed a lot of kind of tier one distributors for the mining industry as an example. And we have strong distributor network also uh, for the down the down the whole side and the geotechnical business. And we really believe that growing with the distributor networks, with the distributors have been signed, who have been part of uh, Robit for a longer time, we have a great opportunity and platform in place to capture the growth. This is a big lever for us. Then we have these four direct sales markets. Peru, South Africa, uh, Finland and Australia. And, and those markets, we have strong sales team. We have experienced sales teams who have track record of delivering growth. And we have high ambition in those markets to capture the potential there is. And this is a, really another big lever uh, for the top hammer growth, uh, top line growth, sorry. One thing impacting top line, but more so impacting profitability is pricing management. And uh, Robit has a very clear pricing strategy and, and there's no plans that we would change our uh, pricing strategy. We are a kind of a challenger in the market and, and we base our pricing on the, on the level of the, bit below the level of the market leaders. But then there are things you can do in master the execution in pricing, having really solid processes in pricing management, having data analytics supporting the decision making and partly also kind of the control that we execute, implement uh, the, the pricing strategy as we have defined it. And we have pockets there that we can improve. And everyone understands that pricing is a big lever on profitability. You know, 1% one, one on, on price more is 1% to your bottom line. And, and uh, you know, you don't need to do necessarily even big improvements and it has a big lever on the overall profitability. And this is something we have established a, what we call a commercial excellence center. They are driving the pricing management process, supporting sales, sales management, don't mean the decision making and, uh, and making sure we, we excel in this process. If you look then the main kind of the cost items, cost elements, materials and services is obviously the biggest. And there we have two big drivers for profitability improvement. First is this sourcing savings, especially by increasing the share of cost competitive country supply. We have had, let's say, traditionally very, fairly low uh, share of, of CCC sourcing. We have a strong supplier network that we work with and I think it's one of our assets today uh, and, and they are our long-term partners that we want to continue also in the, in the future. But there is a certain share uh, and as we grow especially that we see great potential in, in uh, CCC sourcing and as a result in uh, improved 
profitability. Also, to design to value initiatives. So basically, initiatives where we design a product that delivers same or better value for the customer, but is maybe designed in a way that we consume less material or it's easier to manufacture. And as a result, the, the manufacturing cost is, is low. This is another big lever on, on uh, uh, improving the profitability and reducing the share of the materials and services on our cost base. A lot of these, let's say, design to value, or there are product ranges that have gone through this process that have been already launched, and some of them there are still on the, on the drawing board, but still it is a kind of a great driver for profitability improvement. Then we have productivity improvement. Productivity improvement both at kind of the operational level, factory level, as well as the white collar uh, productivity. So as I mentioned, when we do investments, we want to have the kind of the best technology. We want to have uh, uh, as high level of automation as possible. And as a result, kind of increase the productivity. And of course, you know, each of our operations, they have their own plans in the day-to-day -day work uh, to, to continuously improve productivity. There are opportunities in the white-collar productivity as well. You know, for example, when we were talking about the inventory planning uh, tools uh, that, you know, will make us more smarter, but also in a more efficient Matter. And I think here also I, I refer to this commercial excellence center that is really supposed to be kind of center of excellence, supporting sales, you know, uh, making generating proposals easier, more efficient, more standardized. And, and as a result, uh, you know, we give the, get the white collar productivity also increased. And then, kind of lastly, this just general operational leverage. The platform we have, the kind of structure we have, we can still grow a lot with this structure. Obviously, we'll add some people here and there, we do investments, but the cost base is not going to grow as fast as, as the sales will grow. So there is clear operational leverage that we can achieve. So from where we are today, or the first half of 2021, to what is our long-term target, we have a clear path how we will achieve. This is kind of an illustration, you know, what gives a bit the scale, what do we expect uh, from the different initiatives. There are obviously, you know, some temporary savings that have been there now due to COVID, less traveling, uh, you know, not so, so many exhibitions, so lower marketing costs and so forth. And eventually they will re recover back once the uh, world resumes more to normal. Still the path towards the 13% EBTA is really solid and, and we, we believe we have actions in place to, to achieve that and the strategy in place that we will achieve that. Investments we've, we've discussed, so this year we will make all in all uh, 6 to 6, 6.5 million euro growth investments, especially supporting our top hammer growth. Also investments on the geotechnical side, as, as was mentioned. 2.2 2 million euro of these investments will be financed with uh, financial leases and, and rest with loans or, or cash. And we will continue the investments in 2022 and 2023. The level will not be as high as it has been uh, or will be 2021. So, you know, it will be less or at the level of, of our depreciations in 2022, 2023, which is less than what the, the 2021 number. Also, beginning of the year, end of last year, we did the decision to kind of 
prioritize service levels uh, because we saw it was a very volatile market. Uh, also, one thing was that you know there was a ro rapid increase on the raw material prices. He wanted to hedge against those increases to, to uh, let's say, support our bottom line. And as a result, there's been an inventory increase during this year. But uh, our target, when we talk about the all, whole networking capital, is that as a percentage of sales, uh, it will be less than 40 and, and will we'll start to uh, go towards, towards the levels where it was end of last year as well. Time for questions. Good, excellent. All right. I see that there we have one question from the audience online, and uh, and there's a question that, what is the dividend plan? Do you plan to pay dividend again soon? Well, there, there's a kind of a dividend dividend policy that Robert has is is that we we pay 20 to 50 percent of the of the profit for the uh, period but uh, there is always consideration you know if if, uh, if the uh, board sees that that there's uh, for example growth investments where where shareholders would get better value then those can be prioritized excellent all right please Hi, coming back to your previous uh, presentation about the capacity dynamics. Is it so that, because you said that you run about 25% of a slack or free capacity, uh, is it so that your closest competitors have the same type of um, capacity or free capacity, or is it so that also the big ones have free capacity, or do they uh, generally run pretty much higher capacity utilization rates than the smaller ones do? Yeah, I, I can't really answer for fact, you know, what, what are the uh, big guys doing. But obviously our target is to be best in class service level in this industry. Because that's one way of winning business, definitely. And, and one great opportunity to win more business is when some of your fellow competitors fail. And, and we want to be there to get the business at that point. And that's why we want to have best-in-class availability to maintain the customers we have, they stay happy, but also to have opportunity or be able to capture the opportunities that come. Because really we want to grow and, and, and this is a big driver for, for growth. Uh, uh, continuing on that, uh, if you want to have the best uh, availability, can you avoid uh, your situation of being kind of gap filler so that leads to volatility, a high volatility in your capacity? No, I, you know, I, I, I think I wouldn't call this strategy that we would be just a gap filler. But in some, some cases, when you enter to a new customer, you might need that chance that you prove your product. And, and you get that, okay, then Robit gets in, customer gets experience from the product, finds out that it's a quality product, uh, brings value to the customer, and then you are in a whole new kind of uh, discussion with the customer that you can tackle the whole spend or you know, be the number one supplier. So I think those are just door openers in a way, but definitely our, we are not the gap filler that that would be a position that we would stay in but they can open the door. Thanks. Good, thank you very much. I'll need to move us on, unfortunately, and I will take your questions then in the, in the questions and answers. Uh, thank you for the journey so far. I think it's been great and, and really, really great presentations from the team so far. What we'll do now is that uh, we'll have uh, Tommy Lehtonen uh, giving us the way forward. And after that, I'll then, then give us uh, some, some uh, notes on the, the questions and answers session that will we'll, we'll run then for about 20, 25 minutes afterwards. But at this point, the presentations will be ended by Tommy Lehtonen, please. 
Thank you, Daniel. So, looking a little bit summary and, and, and way, way forward. Again, looking at, of course, the, the core targets for Robit, uh, the 15% organic growth and 13% EBITDA and 200 million euro uh, big goal, 10% market share. So I hope these presentations today a little bit opened up our plans, how we plan to achieve the targets. We are kind of confident that we, we see the path, we have clarity on, on how we are going to do it. It's more about quality of execution now for us. You know, in the, we are aligned in the organization. As you see also between the presentations, there is a pretty strong alignment. And, and as, as an organization, we have alignment for these plans. So really focus is on quality, quality and, and, and quick implementation currently. So just to, to summarize, really, our aim is to capture full, the full potential of the platform we have built. If you look at uh, the market demand, of course, it's always a foundation of a business. Is there customer demand? We have a great position in that way. We have 5% market share in a, in a 2 billion market, which is very stable in demand by nature. So it gives us a good space to develop our business in. We have a strong global team and a platform that gives us the foundation for, for driving toward our targets. Again, we focus on our research and development agenda to ensure that we achieve our targeted best-in-class value. I got really nice feedback last week in Las Vegas for our products. We, we are really confident with the offering we have. We have excellent and, uh, and scalable supply chain. So while we grow, actually kind of the operational leverage truly is there. We can get a lot out of these walls, a lot more out of the walls we have. And we are building our capabilities towards our target of best-in-class availability. We still have plenty of profitability improvement potential. You saw the, the, the kind of themes we are working on related to, uh, okay, of course, top-line leverage is there, but additionally, the margin improvement. When we talk about the fixed cost as such, our current fixed cost level allows us still to grow and, and step by step uh, only, only, let's say, probably around 10% growth easily with this fixed cost level. And then, you know, we lead, start to gradually uh, increase our resources, but not at the pace of, of top line. So as an organization, we are, we are focused on quickly, urgently, moving the company where we are today, which is, let's say, a good trend to actually having a good performance. This is really that, you know, we are not satisfied with just having the good trend. Now it's really the ambition and, and, and we are eager to start to deliver a proper performance as well. So that's to conclude our today's presentation. And hopefully, thank you for taking the time and hopefully this really opened up little bit our plans and it was also really nice to introduce some of the Robit colleagues and, and I thank also them for great presentations. Excellent. Thank you Tommy, thank you the team for great presentations. Good. Now what we'll do is we'll uh, break for a short 10 minute uh, technical break so that we can set up the questions and answers session. And, uh, and at that point, of course, the audience again here has the advantage of, of just putting up their hands. Uh, I've picked out, up, out already about eight questions from the chat that we'll discuss, but you also have a chance of calling in. So you have the numbers there that, that you're able to call to and we'll be able to actually hear your voice, which is always great, and, and, and present questions to the, to the team. Thanks so much for the journey so far, and uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Excellent. Welcome back to the Robert Capital Markets Day, and hopefully we've got the online viewers still with us, excited for good questions and answers, and of course the, the crew here on site. Thank you very much for still staying with us. I believe we, have, we don't have currently any calls on hold, so you still have an opportunity. You've got the instructions there if you want to call in. would be great to also, also uh, uh, hear your voices, but uh, I, I believe we have quite a few good questions already already that, that we, can, we can get at this point. But, and the team will alert me if someone is calling in, and, uh, and, and we'll, get to, we'll get to that then as well. But at this point, uh, there were some questions, and I'll try to take this pretty much kind of like in the sequence as the, as the uh, pre presentations were. And, uh, and the first one would be going to Tommy, and this is a bit about personnel. There was an observation that personnel has grown a little bit. Where have you added personnel? And what is the personnel turnover? And uh, also uh, the continuation then that how do you keep the best drilling consumable specialists working for Robit and not moving to competitors? But if we start with the addition of personnel and the turnover. Yeah, turnover of our personnel recently has been somewhat below 10%. So I would say on a, on a normal healthy level uh, as such. And if you look at uh, where we added personnel, uh, okay, we have added selectively sales personnel like, <laughs> like uh, George here as a an, as an very good concrete example. And, and that we kind of do continuously, but it's very selective work. So if we have some good qualified salespeople available, we are always looking into that. Uh, also, we had, have had little bit resources to, to manufacturing and now, so it's, it's kind of a selective mainly sales focus, customer, frontline focus when we add personnel. Okay. Maybe just one, one thing to add, that when we look the end of June number, we always have summer trainees in the number, and that increases the number a bit uh, uh, that we see. Okay. So not all of the kind of the additions are, are permanent positions. All right. And I think there was a good continuation question of that. I mean, we talk a lot about consultative sales and us having the best, best teams. How do we keep the best talent? What yeah, I think uh, Robit is an exciting place to work for, right? We have a nice, nice team, focused professionals. So that's, of course, the fundamental. What's the company culture? Are the plans credible that you, know, you, you believe in what you do, right? Purpose is the biggest thing for people. And of course, while we've been trending positively, it gives positive energy to people and, and want to participate. So I think people want to, want to participate in something that makes sense, have a purpose in their life, and, and, and you know, there is no frustrations because I don't understand what we are trying to do. So I think that's really the key element. Of course, you know, good incentive plans and so on and so on, but really the purpose is a big thing and the company culture to me. Excellent, very good. All right, then we'll move on to another one that was during your presentation, actually, Tommy, um, about acquisitions. What is the status of the integration of the acquisitions made over the past few years, especially Halco, and, uh, and have the expectations and targets for the acquisitions been met? What do you say? I mean, uh, all the acquisitions are fully integrated into Robit. They are part of our global organization, uh, you know, so, so the organization is not based on, for example, the legacy, or legacy companies for a long time anymore. Integration has been done. Naturally, for top line, we haven't met all the targets for initial targets, targets for the acquisitions. But I would say still the fundamental target, which was the expansion of the offering, has already provided us uh, quantifiable results. For example, the key distributors we sign really appreciate the fact that we have this comprehensive offering for them to attack all the needs of the mining customers. And again, looking at the market potential that we increased through the acquisitions, we, we almost doubled the, the market potential. Good, thank you. All right, then I think we could, we could actually move uh, a bit to the, to the crowd here. Did I understand that maybe Erki from Inderes had some question on sustainability that I rudely uh, uh, broke off? Uh, do you want to possibly make that question? Please, the microphone, yes. 
I, I could actually, yes, because you talk about uh, uh, kind of expanding your uh, scope on, uh, on ESG. How easy is it to get information from your suppliers regarding their sustainability? And have you already identified suppliers that clearly need to improve or are at risk of being replaced? Yeah, I think as also mentioned, we generally work with long-term partners also on the on the supply side, and uh, and I think you know there's been common understanding on these aspects for a long time, and some of our suppliers might have even higher kind of ambition levels than than uh, we do. Uh, but still, I think to be fair, we are still th the roadmap we went through, we are kind of early stages in starting to implement that. And uh, I'm sure we will find that it's not all that smooth right. And, and you know, there might be some decisions we need to take as we go, go down the line. Thanks. Good. Then I think we'll, we'll turn uh, back into a question that was in the chat, and this would go into, into George's uh, presentation. And, and there was a question a bit about uh, mining versus construction that we talk about. Do we see more growth in mining versus construction on a global basis as we are focusing more on mining today? What do you think? I wouldn't say there is more growth. I wouldn't look at it like this. But uh, mining, as I tried to explain a little bit earlier on, is um, a little bit more stable environment. It's a stable, a more stable platform for us to, to especially increase market share. Um, construction, we know, for example, in cases like uh, COVID now, I mean, we know certain governments are having stimuli programs for their economies and they, they spend, there is expenditure. But in, in, in a nutshell, mining, in my opinion, is more sustainable compared to, to construction business. Okay. Yeah, Daniel, yeah, if I may, may add a little bit. Of course, we see construction as, as well as an opportunity and there are these, uh, you know, uh, big investments from governments uh, going on and, and a lot of funding coming to construction. And, and, and we are there also to look at capturing those opportunities. But mining as, as, as kind of a nature of a business, again, we want to emphasize the fact that for our product, the demand is really stable. So that creates kind of a foundation, continuous foundation for us and potentially speak, while we are then more opportunistic looking at this construction opportunities. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Then a, a bit still staying on the topic, um, there was a comment that mining is a very consolidated industry or it can even keep on centralizing to some uh, key players or big, big players. How would you comment, and we'll start with George, on Robert's dependence on a few key customers and how do we ensure continuity of contracts? Yeah, consolidation is a fact. I mean, it happened and it continues to happen, but I think we're pretty independent when it comes to, to our business. We, we speak to the mine level. I mean, we, this is where we do our sales and this is where everything takes place for us. It's the mine site. So the consolidation happens in, in, in different rooms where we're not uh, necessarily present. Um, and the question about contracts, how we... Yeah, how do, how do we ensure the continuity of those contracts? Are we able to win them over again? It's, it's, I think since we're present, and this is the being locally present with strong distributor network, with uh, direct markets, experienced people, if we're always present, then we, we make sure that we continue these, uh, these contracts. This is the, the only way forward. Okay. And Tommy, One comment? quick addition maybe that the largest customer of Robit is clearly below 10% of our net sales. And our customer risk as such is, yep. is pretty well under control. Good. Thank you. Then this one going to Tommy, and, and this is a bit about the different SBAs. Um, why is the DTH not growing as fast as the top hammer uh, and at 15% a year? Yeah, I, I believe we are further in our globalization journey with, with our top hammer products. So Robert has been working on, on, on multiple markets for a longer time. It's not like we are in the beginning of our journey related to mining down the hall. Actually, we ha have been taking steps already during this year. For example, the, the growth out outside of Australia for our down the hall mining has been, has been fairly good. And, and we are kind of taking the first steps to globalize that business as well. And again, we are further down on the road, but uh, 
we, we, we have a good plan also in place for down the hall. Excellent. Thank you very much. Then I actually believe that we had an audience question, which I also interrupted the discussion on the service levels. Did we have a possibly from, from Erki again uh, something on the service levels, or did you get an answer already? <laughs> I, I believe you keep good notes, so... <laughs> Actually, it was it was not about service. It was about uh, oops, piling maybe. But that would be a great question. Will hasn't gotten to answer yet, so so please something on piling. Uh, that was all, that's already already been asked as well. So skip me for the time being. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Um, Can I ask a follow-up on the Australia? Yeah, no, definitely. Let's get the microphone over here. Yeah, that was mentioned that the down to hole growth, ex excluding Australia, has been good. So, just an update. What's the plan for Australia going forward? How to uh, get that to uh, support growth and uh, yeah, we, get to double digits? Yeah, I mean, again, you, you've seen that we're taking some steps in Australia forward. And, and, and it's about uh, building a team further, a little bit stronger. And, and, and continuing on a kind of a solid uh, self-management plan we have. We have already hired you know, very senior industry people in, in our organization. And they've been working there, let's say, six months time. The new team, and, and OK, it, progress is starting to come through. We continue to work on that part, but at the same time, you know, to have a solid sales, sales management process in place to, to drive the growth. Good. At this point, I'll, I'll look at the team. We didn't have anyone on the calls at the moment right now. Yes, okay, question. all right, yes. Um, but then the first row, we have some, some questions here, please. Yes, this is Ton Skogmar from, from Carnegie. Uh, I would like to ask, do you buy steel and special steel grades from Sandvik? Well, we don't comment the specific suppliers that, that we, are, we are using, so. But I, I, I mean, it's kind of a big business risk if you're really dependent on getting steel from one of your main competitors. Or do you have alternative suppliers for, or are you really dependent on Sandvik in that sense? Well, that I can answer. No, we are not dependent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I wonder about this growth agenda and, and, and the investments needed. Uh, you know, will CapEx be, you know, could you give some kind of rough indication how CapEx will be compared to depreciation in order to, to grow by, you know, the 15% that you target? Will, the, you know, the depreciation level just grow and grow and grow all the time or, or what will happen? Yeah, so this year we had a bit higher investments and it was partly related that we need to kind of restructure a bit the layouts in, in, in Lempala and uh, get this new factory building in use. Going forward now, if you look kind of this strategy period, what we will do, they will be just bottleneck. We don't need to invest into walls, you know. We, we need to invest into bottleneck machinery, maybe some automation and so forth. So the capex level will be below the depreciations. So, yeah, so capex will now, from now on, basically be, be lower than, than depreciation. So the share of depreciation will go down. But I still wonder, kind of, what, what you don't have any target for return on capital employed or, or so. But if you want to be a, a, a growth company, you know, and it's a capital-intensive industry, you have very large networking capital compared to sales. So, what, what kind of levels of return on capital employed do you think you should? be able to reach, you know, when you, you're at your kind of target levels. Yeah, well, that's obviously where we, where we haven't given out any, any public targets. And, uh, and I'm sure you have also good analysis to show where, where this is driving. But where on the networking capital is, is uh, where we aim that we are below 40% level. And we've been now, first half of this year, we were, we were above that level. So that's where we target to uh, free up capital, all in all. And, and then, you know, with this 13% EPTA, it will drive, drive us to a certain uh, return on capital, capital levels. And a comment uh, from Tommy. There is maybe a little bit of repetition. I just want to highlight the fact that 
we actually looked at the, the inventory levels already end of last year, and we saw the, the challenges related to logistics, uh, you know, the, the challenges we had a little bit related to top hammer capacity. And we really prioritized for short term, it's better to ensure availability and maintain our customers and accept slightly higher. So it was a conscious decision to, to do it. Good. Uh, have you considered starting to report you know, volume growth because the steel content is of course very high, you know, and that goes up and you know, with the, your sales go up and down with, with you know, steel prices, etc. So I think it would be good to get volume numbers somehow. Mm, yeah, yeah well, well, not something we have considered, but it's, it's a good, good point in that sense. But let's say, if you think the market price dynamics in drilling consumable business, you can't directly read it when if you look, you know, how is the steel price fluctuating, you know, it's not like that the steel price changes would straight away immediately go, go to the drilling consumable market price levels when the raw materials go up or raw materials go down. So the dynamics are still a bit different. Yeah, so, so that was kind of my, my next question. Where, where do you think, you know, wh where are we, you know, with, you know, pricing against the input costs at the moment, given, you know, iron ore has, you know, collapsed, but, but steel is still, you know, pretty high. And, you know, it's very hard to get an insight into your, of course, contracts, what you have and how, how long do you agree, you know, your input costs ahead? Maybe Arthur, you can comment a little bit. I can comment uh, yeah, recently yeah. about the uh, raw material prices for us. Well, there are different kind of uh, contracts in place on, on, on some of, let's say, if you talk about the raw material, the, let's say the fluctuations come faster. On some, we might have fixed pricing for a, for a year. Some might be quarterly changing or things like that. It's, it is a big, bit mixed back. But whatever the changes are, you know, they, there is still uh, kind of a slowness when they start to be visible or, or start, to, start to realize in that, that sense. And that gives us kind of visibility to take actions then, especially in this kind of a market where everyone's input costs have gone up, meaning that the market price is going also up. So it gives us time to implement changes then on the on the other part of the equation. Yeah, Tommy, just to confirm the comment there that all the suppliers in this situation have made price increases. Yeah. So the market cost increases have been transferred partially to the customers already. And, th and then this kind of a, perhaps a pandemic question that that your you know, at least two of your competitors have very large organizations, you know, globally. In, in place while you are in most markets, as you have highlighted, dependent on distributors. Do you think you know, it has been a, an advantage or disadvantage? You know, and, and, and how do we get out of this? Will there be kind of dynamic changes? Yeah, I, I think it may be, not at, li at least I don't think it's a disadvantage for us. Actually, I believe it's an advantage because our distributors basically are looking at the single country or they are present in the country. And as we know in the in this uh, pandemic, basically the, the difficulty came from traveling from country to country. So in those local markets, when we have mainly persons are serving customers in their country, you know, we've been able to continue to serve our customers on a good level. So local presence to me has been an advantage. And, and then, then, then a last question perhaps about this ESG. So I didn't, I think it was a good question that was put here about what happens to the drill bits I mean, it's only like, I don't know exactly, but I assume it's like 10% that, that is kind of disappearing of the weight and 90% could be fully recycled and just put back into your factories and then you put on, you know, the top again or... Tommy, please. Yeah, I think if you look at the whole mining process, because we are small part of a mine, right, the drill pit, there is a lot of metal consumables used in many, many, many tons, in mills, crushers, and so on, in much, much higher volumes than our part. So for sure, mind, uh, mines are geared up for metal recycling as such. It's, it's clear. Yeah, but, but it's not possible just to, to 
replace you know, the, the critical part and, and change the business model long term? Or? So what we do is that we re-grind. Okay. So, so you can service the drill bit and you it can extend the life uh, of a drill bit. So that is what we do to extend the kind of the lifetime uh, of, a, of a product. It's uh, re-grinding the carbide. With that you can extend the lifetime of the bit, Quite but not the, the body itself. Good, excellent. I believe we then had a question over here. Please, if we can get the mic so then the online audience gets to hear the good questions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Still about the industry consolidation. Is there anything fundamental why Robit itself would not become an acquisition target? Or do the customers like your independence so much that they wouldn't be pleased if you became a part of a bigger entity? Yeah, I mean, of course, we cannot talk about other people's plans, right? You know, there, there may be somebody making that. a proposal, and, and, and of course, that's kind of a possibility always. And, and I believe customers like the way we are today, you are right, that they, they appreciate the fact that there is a focused, independent drilling consumables company. It's nice in this business that the drilling consumables decision clearly like a culture of the industry is that it's a separate decision from the equipment. So, so and that, that kind of supports our position nicely. And, and my opinion is that customers appreciate that we are independent. Thank you. Good. Do we have any further questions from the, from the audience here? I think it's been great discussion so far. And looking at the technical team, we don't have anyone online either. All right. Good. I think then at this point, it's, uh, we are coming to the, to the end of our event. Warm thank you to the presenters. It's been great working thank with you. you. Daniel. And uh, thank you to the, to the audience here. A couple of comments. Uh, first of all, if there still are more questions, you can address them to investors at robitgroup.com. And also, we will make a recording of this event available on our company website uh, at a later stage when we've, we've gotten it actually uh, uploaded there. At this point, I would shortly put it that it's exciting to be on this journey together. And uh, thank you for a great event. And thank you, everyone here. Thank you and thank goodbye. You. Thank you. This is the Robert Way Forward.